Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming today. Uh, I would like to introduce to you our Vice President of the Haitian Studies Association, Ms. Cecile Asilien. Bienvenue, bienvenue. Welcome, everyone. On behalf of the Haitian Studies Association and especially the Executive Board um, and the members and President Regine Jackson, I want to thank you for being here this afternoon. Moi vle di tout moun merci pou présence nou après-midi a au nom de l'association Etid Haïtien et surtout au nom de président Regine Jackson qui pat kala avec nous jodi a. A special thanks to the Emerging Scholars Committee who is hosting this event and in particular Petrushka Moise, Irene Brisson and Mikael Villemont, who will be interpreting for us. So, merci en pile. Merci à Comité Jeune Chechea, c'est au Cap Fait événement après-midi. Et en particulier, nous voulons dire merci à Petrushka Moïse, Irene Brisson, et Mikael Villemont, qui a interprété pour nous. Just a few um, reminder our 34th annual conference will be held from October 7 to the 9th at Howard University. We are very excited, not only because we are going to be at um, Howard, a mecca of Black intellectualism and Black excellence, but also we are excited about the theme of our conference, Marunage. It is particularly apropos in our current um, global world, both what is happening in Haiti and the Haitian diaspora. So we will have a very exciting conference um, that promises to be enlightening and also where we will try to work with uh, local partners because we are not just scholars, but we are also artists and activists. And as we say in Haitian Creole, en pile palo. With many hands, the load is lighter. It takes all of us. I want to remind everyone that the conference 34th conference annual has been held at the University of Howard. The University of Howard is a university that is very important and it is a center of the intellectual community that is always reuni. So we are very happy que nous avons l'opportunité pour nous faire conférence là là. Nous content en pile en pile tout parce que thème conférence là c'est marronage. Ils a fait marronage là important surtout dans moment n'a vive là ni ça qui passé dans pays nous Haïti mais ça qui passé dans diaspora et ça qui passé dans monde là globalement. Alors n'a pas nous Howard nous connaît ou passer un bon moment abgen activist, abgen artist, abgen tout sort d'intellectuel nous pral brasser l'idée sous différents situations et sous différents praxis et n'a content wèw. Dernier bagay mwen ta vle mentionner c'est que uh, comité jeune chercheur a gen pri Michel Wolf Trouyoa si ou ta remen nomine yon moun, ou yon ta remen nomine te tout, tan pri, ou ap jone informasyon ke Irene fek mette nan chat la. The last thing I wanna remind everyone is that the Emerging Scholars has um, the Michelle Wolf to your award, and Irene just put it on the chat. If you would like to nominate someone or um, self-nomination, please go to the link so that you can um, see what you need to do. Lastly, I also want to thank um, Julio, who is the person behind the scene who makes all this magic happen. Without him, we will not um, be able to be here because I don't know how this all works, but it happens by magic. So a big thank you um, to Julio. And also, I believe it's it's um, always important to acknowledge some of our founders because we sit on the shoulders of those who came before us. So in that regard, I just want to acknowledge the 
presence of Dr. Claudine Michel, one of the founders of HSC, Mama HSC, as we say to her in Creole. Um, moi, je voulais remercier Julio, qui c'est lui qui fait tout gros travail pour faire magie, pour faire um, tout pour faire tout ça arriver, pour faire magie, si vous voulez, pour, pour tout le bagage bien marché, um, en thème technologie. Et tout le monde veut faire un aïe-bobo spécial pour Dr. Claudine Michel, qui est là, un fondateur HSC. OK, merci en pile. Um, thank you very much. I will pass it um, to Irene, who will introduce our moderator, Dr. Petrushka Moïse. Thank you. Merci, Dr. Irene Buisson. Ok, oui, merci. Je um, passe directement pour Petrushka Moïse, uh, uh, an assistant professor. I don't have this language in my head and crew. Uh, assistant professor na na College Grinnell, and um, Petrushka Moïse is assistant professor at Grinnell College and will be um, orienting us to today's activities. Thanks. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, hello, everyone. I want to thank everyone for coming to today's Emerging Scholars Roundtable, Thinking Creatively Through COVID. This will be primarily an English-speaking uh, presentation, but I thank Mikael Belmont, who will be summarizing for our Creole speakers, as well as Sophie Zidor, who will have, be uh, back channeling and answering any questions in the chat and translating in the chat. So I thank you very much for our behind the scenes people because without them, this would be very flat, but we definitely want to make this very dynamic. So moi, mais c'est tout moi qui vini jodia, pour ta bon que n'a fait jodia pour chercher émergent, n'a pas les jodia de penser avec créativité durant, durant uh, COVID. So, Pour jodi a na plus ou moins parler en en anglais mais nous gen Mikael la ka bon nou en version en créole pour moun yo ki parle créole ki parle français nan nan chèm nan et nou gen Sophonie ka si si ou vle taper en question que li ka ba ou réponse so nou remercie tout moun ki a travay pou pou fè jodi en bon journée and so on vle commencer pour Monday, uh, pardon, Monday, excuse. Um, I would like to begin to say um, my apologies because we were scheduled for to to have four presenters today, um, but unfortunately, Dr. Shavala Rivera and Ms. Valerie uh, Dewis has taken ill, and so of course we send our prayers and good wishes to them as they recover. So for today. We have Dr. Sinatra Smith, Dr. Joyce Jackson, and myself presenting. So, je dis à mon excuse parce que nous sommes supposés présenter quatre personnes aujourd'hui, mais deux personnes prennent malade, so nous prié pour eux. So, je dis à nous avons Dr. Sinatra Smith et Dr. Joyce Jackson. So, nous avons commencé pour dire que. Um, so today's format, I'm sorry, I'm going back and forth, going to make sure I'm trying to get all the checklists right. Um, so, in today's format, the way that we will be presenting um, is as the presenters present, then Mikhail will summarize their work. And then after all of the presenters have gone through, we will have a Q&A. And in the Q&A, we will give uh, the audience time as we are asking questions among ourselves for you to post your questions on a Google Doc. So then we will offer open the floor to the audience to ask their questions. And just as a formality, uh, our HSA event today is being recorded. So if you have any issues or problems with that, we just ask you to uh, just keep your cameras off if you do not want to be recorded. So thank you very much. So let us begin today as to how did this come about? So. As being part of the Emerging Scholars Committee, um, it was asked of us to think of a topic to discuss that we found that would be beneficial to Emerging Scholars and to the AHSA membership as a whole. And when it came to my turn to present, 
um, I really started to think about um, our two years in review. And we have been through so many workshops about COVID and about so many other subjects uh, that has made us acclimated to thinking of, in the sense of the, <laughs> the detriment that has happened to our careers, to our lifestyles, to our mental health. But I think that there's also the, the necessary need to evaluate the pros because we know what the cons were. But I think this is an opportunity to give stage to the pros of how creativity came into our pause. And so with that, I reached out to my colleagues and to my mentors and to say how well did they reinvent themselves in the process and how did that reinvention led to their ability to be their better selves in the workplace to themselves and to their community. So I will begin with Dr. Sinatra Smith. Dr. Smith is an Afrofuturist cultural preservationist. She is a fellow CLEAR DLF postdoctoral fellow in data curation for African-American studies for the Philadelphia Museum of Arts and Temple University Libraries. Um, in, you will find her bio on the HSA website, but just to kind of get the good, the good nuggets out of this stuff, um, Dr. Sinatra's work focuses on the ways in which Black cultural landscapes transform accesses to special collections and archives through a Black speculative methodology that utilizes extended reality, XR, and other digital humanity tools. In her postdoctoral fellowship, she recently launched a project entitled Sacred Geographic Superimpositions, which is a spiritual scholarly endeavor to document and celebrate ephemeral Black public art in Philadelphia in a manner that transports them into the ancestral plane of the transformative archives to bring scholarly research and data curation out of the academy into a curated space grounded in storytelling and interpretation through story mapping and augmented reality. I welcome Dr. Sinatra Smith. Thank you, Dr. Petrushka Moyes. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And I entitled this presentation, Doing the Best I Can With What I Got. And it comes from a Mariah Carey meme of her saying something, I'll have a little gif of it at the end. Um, but overall, my experience through COVID has been quite phenomenal. I started this journey um, unemployed. I had gotten fired the Saturday before Christmas and of 2019, and then unemployed, you know, all throughout and um, COVID hit. And that actually kind of changed the way that I felt about my unemployment. A lot of folks were losing their jobs. I lost mine in a, in a way where I could still kind of sustain myself. Can't say that for a lot of other folks, people were getting sick and dying and everything. So I started to become a lot more grateful for my circumstances. Um, and then I um, was graciously awarded the opportunity to, to participate in this po postdoctoral fellowship and um, decided at a certain point, I realized that um, the fellowship is what I make it. No one was going to uh, micromanage me. No one was going to force me in any particular direction. I could kind of choose what I wanted to do um, and which digital tools I wanted to learn within my libraries. And so I decided to start getting really creative about how I would spend my time. So in this presentation, I've got four main points that I want to hit, which are the ways that I used my time during COVID. Um, enhancing my marketability, building my portfolio, sharing my expertise, and most importantly, maintaining um, my self-care. So in terms of using professional develop to enhance my and professional development, sorry, to enhance my marketability, there are kind of two ways that I did this. One was attending virtual trainings, and the other was doing some self-guided trainings through what I call YouTube University and then just kind of general Google searches. So in the beginning of my fellowship, I just kind of did a more exploratory, what are the things that I could benefit from at least knowing about 
even if that's not the direct uh, career path that I go into. So I started with taking a coding course on HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, which is basically how you build a website. Um, it's a very clunky website. It doesn't look great, the one that I built by the end of the course, but I was able to code the entire thing myself, determine the colors, the text, um, and get some functionality with buttons and everything. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And I did it with some other folks who were in my fellowship, some folks who were not in my fellowship. I think Patricia, you also joined um, us on that coding workshop. And we had a little, um, I think it was a WhatsApp group where we kind of talk about what we were doing. And then the next thing I did was the basics of archiving um, workshop through the American Association for State and Local History because I was in the library and archives at one of my institutions and I've never done archival work, at least not in a professional capacity beyond like figuring some things out myself. So I decided to take that course and it was, it, they're all kind of self-guided because they're all virtual courses, but I was able to get a lot of background information to understand how my department functions. And then I went on to do the digital archive specialist certificate per the recommendation of the archivist at the Charles L. Bloxon Afro-American Collection at Temple University Libraries. Um, she was helping me position myself for when this fellowship is over, let's get a job, let's get a permanent position, right? So. That was through the Society of American Archivists, another completely virtual thing, which originally there's an in-person component um, at their conference that's required in order to complete that certificate. But because of COVID, nothing's happening in person, of course. So they changed that into a, um, a Zoom in-person training for, I think, two days or something like that. So I was still able to take advantage of the fact that we are in a virtual world. I don't have to travel anywhere. It wasn't particularly expensive. I've got a research stipend that can cover these things and um, kind of move forward with that. And then fast forward to, I believe, June. I believe June of this year. Um, the Association of African American Museums entered a partnership with the Howard University School of Business to uh, offer this advanced executive leadership uh, workshop that we did for about a week. I think it was like Monday through Thursday. So those of us who were members, they invited some of us to participate and then other members could also participate. And we were um, we did this at a, a super discounted rate. I think the course is supposed to be $2,500 and we were able to do it for $125 which is a huge discount, right? Just that's, that's that little like, okay, I paid something so I'll show up, but it didn't break the bank, which was wonderful. So I got to participate in that um, and shout out to my, my capstone project group because we actually won. We didn't know there was a competition, but we won the presentations at the end. So learned a lot. Um, I'm not currently in an executive position, so I'll, I'll have a lot to, to apply in the future when I do get to that level. Um, and then the other side of the professional development was the self-guided trainings. So again, I looked at YouTube. YouTube has a lot of content. Um, the, the struggle is that it has a lot of content for several years and technology changes so often that you can really only look at things from a few years ago. So as I was learning how to use one particular software called Unity, um, I started that in uh, fall of 2020, I believe, or do, some, somewhere around there, like December, 2020. So I couldn't look at anything that came out before 2018. So most of the content, of course, online is from before that because that's just time, that's just how it works. But I wasn't able to use any of those. So I just spent a lot of time kind of figuring out the, the bits and pieces that were missing through the YouTube videos and finding videos that would build on something that someone else explained or fill in a missing piece because of course they don't give you all the information in one single video that would be too much like right so um, I use that uh, mainly for some of those latter points on augmented reality um, and some of the 3d modeling I was able to do an actual training so I need to probably edit this slideshow, slideshow but I did an actual training for photogrammetry to learn how to create 3d models of um, objects through photography and then use the software to stitch all of those photos together and create the 3D model. Um, and then in terms of linked open data and Sparkle, which is a um, querying language for Wikidata, I was able to use kind of some virtual uh, trainings that my colleagues had been to, plus Wikidata has its own training on their website. So I self-guided my way through that and then just kind of Googled how to, how to 
search for certain things using the Sparkle coding lang querying language. It's kind of, it's like a coding language, but it's for querying a database. Um, and so with all of that put together, now I can add these skills to my CV, which is wonderful. Uh, the next thing that I did during my, my time with COVID or during COVID, not with COVID, uh, was using digital projects to build my portfolio. So um, as I mentioned, there was a Wikidata project and that was specifically to enhance the digi digital visibility of black artists in the Philadelphia Museum of Art um, collection. So I originally was planning to just do the local artists and then found that the list of like 50 or so, might've been a little bit more, um, local black artists only had 10 or fewer women on it. So I decided to do all of the black women, regardless of where they're from, where they've lived, whatever, and was able to kind of expand that project to include both of my institutions. So we did a Wikidata edit-a-thon where we taught folks how to edit Wikidata, why Wikidata is important. When you do a Google search on like black sculptors who live in Philadelphia, the little box that comes up on the side with all of that data is pulled from Wikidata. So it's really important as you're trying to find information on the web about different topics to make sure that those Wikidata records are updated um, on the linked data side versus the text side on Wikipedia. Um, there's also a fellowship that we did with some folks through a program that's hosted through Drexel University. They're called the Leading Fellows. And so I had two fellows working with me on um, developing methodologies that are easier to share uh, for editing, querying, and visualizing data through Wikidata. So if you go to that link bit.ly slash Wikidata blogs, that has all of that information. I wrote the first one about designing a Wikidata project and all of the kind of work that went into a cross-institutional um, program. And then there's another blog from one of the fellows about editing, another from the other fellow about querying, and then a third one with some data visualizations that they did and how they used Python to do all of this stuff. Um, the next project that I was working on is called Philly Necro Futures to address under-resourced Black collections at predominantly white institutions, which came from just having coffee outside with a colleague. There was a new fellow who was working on her um, doctorate at University of Pennsylvania, who just happened to be a fellow at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. We ran into each other at, um, I think it was a fellows meeting, and she mentioned Paul Gilroy, and I sent her a message and said, we've got to talk. You've mentioned the magic name. I need to know more about you. I want to share all about me. We had coffee outside one day because COVID, right? And um, eventually came up with this project. So she was already working on researching um, African sculptures that are in our European paintings department. Notice I said African sculptures in European paintings, okay? Um, so <laughs> she was researching those objects to update their curatorial labels. She knew that I had this 3D modeling expertise. So we combined forces and created a story map that includes those 3D models, that includes her research. Um, and it'll show where those objects came from on the continent because European paintings does not describe these objects at all to any degree. Um, the third major project that I was working on um, over the course of a year was Sacred Geographic Superimpositions. And the real impetus behind this uh, project was to learn how to use augmented reality software in order to do a project that would be the executable at another small institution. The, I originally came from, even though they fired me, but I came from a, a very small Black institution in Maryland. It was a museum. And when you have a small institution like that, resources are limited. There's limited funding, limited capacity, limited staff, and all of that. And so I wanted to see, is there a way to build a methodology to do this type of work with mapping, augmented reality, 3D modeling, research, all of that on a, 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 an impressive scale, but with limited staff and limited funding without having to use a bunch of things or contract a company to do your, your app and all that kind of stuff. You really don't have to have anyone else do that work for you. So I was able to do that over the course of a year and I um, was able to even build an augmented reality app that is in the Apple App Store. So if you go to bit.ly slash sacredgs, you can get all of the information about that project. The other project, bit.ly slash Philly Necro Futures is available there. So that was another important piece was making sure that this stuff is on the internet at websites that I can remember and easily tell someone, which is why they all have bit.ly links because the actual links are very long and convoluted. 
Um, but this is a way to kind of share out what I've been doing. The next thing was I did, I hosted, or I, I led the planning of an Afrofuturism and Digital Humanities Symposium at Temple University Libraries. And we invited scholars from other institutions to come and speak. We showed off the projects that we're doing within my department. Um, we had, we have a new, our new graduate director of Africology and African, African American Studies um, at Temple is Renaldo Anderson, and he is a genius in the Black speculative arts movement and Afrofuturism. So he gave our keynote speech, which was amazing. And then we were able to publish or submit, still working on it, but submit for publication a special issue of the Journal of Black Studies um, to share that work out beyond uh, just the symposium itself. And then lastly, I've joined a lot of different committees and working groups across my institutions and within my professional association so that I could get some leadership experience. Um, I was the primary mentor for those, those um, fellows that I mentioned earlier that worked on the Wikidata project. I've also recently become, I think as of a, maybe a year, a little less than a year ago, eh, maybe like six months ago, um, the co-chair of the Advocates for Black Representation staff working group at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I've been a mentor for the Robert F. Smith internship program through the National Museum of African American History and Culture twice. And I was also the co-editor of the Curated Futures Project with the Council on Library and Information Resources, which Patricia actually published in um, a podcast series. So it's a very non-traditional publication, which is really exciting. All right, the third leg of what I've done during COVID is using extracurricular and contract work to share my expertise. So be more than just making sure there's a website, I wanted to make sure people actually knew about the work that I'm doing. So um, within the professional association that I'm a member of, which is again, the Association of African-American Museums, I was on the Emerging Museum Professionals Committee as the secretary, and so we did um, programming similar to what this group does for emerging museum scholars uh, within the Black Museum field. Um, I've also participated in, in, in presented at planning all of that virtual conferences. And then I am in a, um, I'm in a working group through the Association of African American Museums to identify ways to build capacity for member institutions through traveling shared and collaborative exhibitions. So we're kind of brand new at that. We started, I think, in like April or something like that. So right now we're in the middle of doing some exploratory research and surveys and things so that we can make sure that the, the um, protocols that we produce are actually serving our, our member institutions needs. And then also not on this slide is that I earned the AAAM Pacesetter Award at conference in August about a week ago, um, which is, you know, a testament to all of this work that I've been doing. Um, and the other side of it in, uh, has been the contracting and consulting opportunities. Uh, the first thing that I was able to do during um, COVID, actually before the, the first thing that's on there, I was able to do some contracted education work with the Banneker Douglas Museum in Annapolis, Maryland. Then I was the, um, I believe, consulting historian, although I'm, I'm an anthropologist by training, but the consulting historian on the uh, Mapping Racism Project with the Hyattsville Community Development Corporation. And that project was for was about contextualizing the historic, historic use of racially restrictive deed covenants to uphold residential segregation in Hyattsville, Maryland. Um, the next project that I was invited to participate on with another colleague who's a clear fellow, Portia Hopkins, Dr. Portia Hopkins, excuse me, um, was the Creating Access to HBCU Library Alliance Archives, um, which was a collaboration with the HBCU Library Alliance and the Council on Library and Information Resources. And so we were able to do this project to understand where uh, the five um, institutions that were included in the study, where they are with digitization, and what kinds of recommendations we have for the institutions themselves, but mainly for the HBCU Library Alliance to improve their digitization efforts and access to their archival records and special collections. And then the last project, which I'm still working on with the same um, individual, Dr. Portia Hopkins, is 500 Years of African American History in South Florida, which is through the Association for the Study of African American Life and History in um, collaboration with the National Park Service to document 500 years of black history in South Florida, surprise, surprise, right? Um, and so the last leg of it, which has been the most important one throughout the entire thing, because needless to say, after getting fired and then a, um, a global pandemic hitting 
a girl may or may not have been depressed, right? So there's uh, one major thing that I like to tap into, which is sewing. Um, my grandmother sewed, my aunts sewed, my mother sewed, like that's kind of a thing for the women in my family on my mother's side. And I learned how to sew when I was in, I guess I took my first class in middle school, but I really learned how to sew in high school. So I've been sewing my clothes ever since. And now I've gotten to the point where I don't even go shopping. If I need something, I just go to the fabric store and make it myself. So I bought all this fabric for the job that I didn't have, right, to create a work wardrobe. And um, it really did pay off. I also, you know, recorded myself and made TikToks because I wanted to be TikTok famous. I still want to be TikTok famous. It's just, I'm not putting as much effort into it anymore. Um, I also became a plant mom. A friend asked me to plant sit two of her plants because she moved to the Virgin Islands and she couldn't take them with her. So I uh, started taking care of her plants, which was, um, it, I, I was afraid at first, I asked her, you know, if I kill these plants, are you going to be upset? But they're still thriving. Okay. So now I've got a whole bunch of plants in my apartment where I'm not right now, which is why there's no plants around me. Um, I also just generally like to support local black owned businesses. Um, I started doing some self-guided wine tour road trips around the Northeast and I also, I, I limit my evening work. I wanted to get into a really healthy relationship with work and like the work, work life balance. And the most important one was no work on the weekends. I'm easy, easy breezy at turning the computer off at the end of the day. And then Saturday morning, I'd wake up and pull my laptop out and start working at seven o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and a Sunday. So I got into the habit of no more work on weekends, period. I did sneak a little bit when I was building that augmented reality app, but otherwise I've been very, very good about that. So that is the end of my very long presentation. <laughs> Thank you all. Again, this is uh, the, the reference for the uh, title of the presentation where Mariah Carey is saying, I'm gonna do the best I can with what I got. Thank you, Dr. Smith. And now we will have Mikhail Vilmot to give a synopsis and summary in Kayla. Um, bonjour tout le monde. So, um, Moi, APC est passé en bagaille dans le commentaire là pour nous, mais il n'y a pas voulu passer. Mais moi, appelé pour nous de Dr. Sinatra. Donc, Dr. Sinatra Smith, c'est un conservateur culturel afro-culturiste qui concentrait sur façon paysage culturel noyau transformé, accès à collection spéciale à archives en travail en météorologie spéculative noire qui utilisait réalité pour loger. Ça veut dire qu'il utilisait une partie virtuelle à réalité. Donc, je dis à lui présenter pour nous quatre points qu'elle a utilisés pour les TK taper dans la um, créativité li pendant la COVID. Il li dit comme ça que la méthodologie Pali, c'est faire ça café avec ça ou gain. Donc, faire ça au café avec ça ou gain, venir de la musique Maria Carey, c'est la méthodologie ça qu'elle a utilisé. Donc, quatre points qu'elle a parlé de eux, c'est le premier point, c'est 20 têtes. Li. Deuxième point, c'est humanité digitale. Troisième point, c'est activité en dehors des travail. Et puis, quatrième point, c'est toucher, conduit, créatif avec intérêt lié. Donc, pour faire le premier point qui c'est 20 têtes, il parlait de deux sujets. Deux sujets, ça y est, c'est que pendant la COVID, il n'y a pas de travail. Donc, pour cette raison, ça, il apprend la technologie. Il apprend la technologie, la qualité pour côté. Et puis, il aussi instruit tête personnellement. Ce so, sont deux étapes qui ont utilisé. Il a instruit tête plus et pour venir plus, comme si il a cherché travail, pour lui plus marketable. Ça veut dire pour lui avalable pour le travail, pour le job travail. Après ça, deuxième point, il dit qu'il a utilisé l'humanité digitale pour lui. Et dans l'humanité digitale, il a appris à utiliser Wikidata parce que Wikidata est important parce qu'il y a appris à monde connaît qui j'ai pu développer toute bagaille ça. Après ça, on lui fait un pile projet mais il lui parlait de l'autre projet qui c'est Philine Fortune et dans projet ça c'est côté de la culture africaine qui était dans un département européen, département français et lui même avec et un groupe de monde de l'autre monde qui était boussier boussière, lui utiliser avec monde ça yo, yo travaille ensemble pour être bien catégorisé et euh, art et que tu as bien catégorisé art mon noyau puis on mettait bon la belle la sur et puis non troisième point il parlait des activités en dehors de travail donc les 
li investi nan organisasyon profesyonel, epi li komanse travay tanku yon konsultan avek yon kontrakter pou travay tanku kat geografik. Kat geografik la ki se mapping. Sa vle di li menm li ede sosyete alan tou li nan travay ki ap ede moun noa avanse E dok, tout travay sa li se yon konsultan personel ou bien yon kontrakter, sa vle di yon employel pou li bay opinion skoler li, opinion tokou savan. E pi nan katriyem nan li di kon sa ke li touche avek intera li e pi kondwi kreativ li. Nan sa li di kon sa li fe TikTok, li vini yon kouturyer e pi li pa travay le weekend. Sa vle di le samdi dimanche li pa travay paske so bagay ki trez epotan. Donc, moi, pral passe notre chat là, il y a un résumé de tout ça, monsieur Dio, et au cas, et lit plus. Merci. Merci, Mikael. Et now we are going to continue with Dr. Joyce M. Jackson, who is the, um, who is a mentor and a close friend of mine, um, who was also on my committee when, for my thesis. Um, Dr. Joyce and I have, uh, been friends longer than we have known each other because we have a whole universe of people who have been trying to get us connected and it took them seven years for us to finally meet. So I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Joyce Marie Jackson, who is the chair of the Department of Geography and Anthropology and the former director of the African and African American Studies at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. Dr. Jackson is the James J. <clears throat> Parsons Endowment Professorship at LSU. She earned her PhD from Indiana University Bloomington in folklore ethnomusicology, and her core research centers on African and African-American diaspora performances centered ritual studies, including the Black Masking Indians and the Baptist Easter Rocks in Louisiana, carnival, carn carnivalistic identities, and community sustainability in Trinidad and Haiti, and women's healing rituals in the Labu ethnic groups in the Northwest region of Senegal, West Africa. So I will now turn the floor over to Dr. Joyce Jackson. Thank you very much, uh, Patricia. Uh, it's wonderful to, to work together again. And I'd like to say good afternoon to everybody. And it's, it's good to be here share some stories with you and uh, some of my sort of reimagined experiences during the pandemic journey. Um, I'll first, I'll, I'll look at uh, academia first, that sort of uh, overpowers my life. But, um, you know, in going through the, the pandemic, I like to talk about some of the things that, that, hi that were highlighted, because what matters most about the campus and also looking at, well, in that particular situation, the non-campus experience. But more importantly, you know, it highlighted what um, and who mattered most in life. So again, uh, as Sinatra says, we have to look at this work balance or relationship. So I had to sort of reimagine my experience because um, uh, as a professor um, and with my students, but I had to look at my, and I always looked at my my classroom as a, a social, an academic social environment. And I had to look at, okay, so how am I going to deal with this now that we're no longer together in the classroom and on these, um, you know, in these virtual settings? So um, I had to look at um, ways of, you know, trying to, of course, um, get them uh, motivated uh, and being on these screens and how to engage them and to have them engage with each other because that that's that's a really important aspect of, of learning too not just getting it from the professor but to uh, talk in these uh, settings where you can actually bring out your ideas and hear your uh, the ideas of your peers so uh, uh, fortunately I had had a training call we call it at LSU I'm, I'm at Louisiana State University and we call it CXC communication across curriculums. And what it is, is just a, a program where we try to put more aspects of communication within the classroom. And, you know, we look at four modes, like the oral communication, written communication, visual, and technology. And we have to decide if we're going to, if we're going to certify our class to be a CXC class, we have to decide to use two of those modes. 
And so I decided to use visual and technology. Well, you know, we already had written because I have written assignments and essays and things like that. So I decided to incorporate uh, the visual and the technology. And of course, many of the students had not dealt with this before and neither had I, <laughs> to tell you the truth. So we were learning together. I took the training for um, a week uh, during the summer. And, um, and one of the main things is, you know, learning how to do all these things and, and, and working on a syllabus to sort of pivot that syllabus to be a CXC syllabus. Uh, so now I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to use this because I'm pivoting to CXC, but I'm also pivoting virtually. Uh, so I had a lot of uh, challenges there. But uh, what I mainly did was to, um, well, we had to deal with what they call Cultura, which is a video program on, on Moodle. Well, then they've cut it out now, but at the time we had Cultura. And um, we used it to, um, you know, they could video themselves and then send the video to me and then I would put it up on class. And so they were able to do sort of critical analysis of a book. Uh, they could start on their proposals and present those to the class. So just about everything the students did, they had to present it to not only me, but also to the class and they could critique each other. And they really got to, and you know, I think they really got to know each other better that way because they were sub submitting everything to me in the class. So everybody knew what everybody else was doing. And um, they actually helped out each other. I think it worked out um, for a class. And, and the other thing in my classes, uh, I always require ethnographies. They have to go out and do field work in all of my classes, whether it's, you know, my diaspora class, folklore in the African diaspora, if it's urban ethnography, if it's a class on rituals or even music, I do a course in black music because I'm also an ethnomusicologist. So in all of my classes, field work is required. So, okay, here we are in this virtual setting in the pandemic, how are we going to do field work? And uh, so we had to really come up with some creative ways. Um, and some of the, the, the folks that uh, the students wanted to interview were maybe family members. Um, and so they were really, getting to, and they really enjoyed this because they were really getting to know some of their family members better. Uh, now they're at home with a lot of folks at the same time and they have to find their little, their little moment or their little area to do their work, but then they could also interview them. And um, some of them had to interview people by email or they had to interview them on the phone, uh, Facebook, so they were, you know, finding all of these uh, ways of getting their ethnographies done. And so it really turned out to be, because, you know, as I said before, they had to come up with some creative thinking and so did I, because some of them couldn't come up with anything. And of course they would come to me and I had to figure out, okay, so what can you do to get some field work done? Um, so those were the two challenges, uh, look, using that CXC program for the first time and also, um, you know, figuring out, okay, how are we gonna do this field work? And, uh, but it really, it really turned out well. And it's, uh, actually students, if they take three courses that are certified CXC, they can actually get graduate with a certification in communication and they can graduate with uh, a CXC medal. So those are the two things that we encourage them to do um, because the communication cross curriculum is, is very good for them because everybody has to do it. So you have them in business, you have them in engineering, and of course in my department, geography and anthropology. Uh, and so all, I mean, so it's across the curriculum, anybody can do, can certain get the certification in uh, CXC. So that was one of the things that was really pivotal for me to try and, and work with my students and to get them engaged and to do the things that we, they needed to do in a virtual setting. Um, so um, see, the other thing that um, I like to talk about uh, is the creative side that emerged uh, from all of this. Uh, I guess I've been sort of like a closet uh, artist, <laughs> but I've always tried to you know, advocate for artists and you know, present others and showcase other artists. I never looked at myself except you know, I'm a performing artist, but I've never been like a visual artist. So that was the other side of me that was trying to come out during COVID. Uh, I, and it, when my electives, in, when I was in school, 
Uh, I was in, uh, I'd have two degrees in music. And so I always thought the visual, you know, was just parallel to the music. I mean, we had the same periods, the Baroque, the Renaissance, the modern, uh, you know, and, and so I always studied art. I mean, studied art history and things like that. I never did take an applied art course in, um, you know, in, in school, but I always took art courses as my uh, electives. So I've always been interested in visual arts. So I said, well, here I am at home. I have this time, <laughs> let me see what I can do. And so I, I looked for art classes and I found one, I did uh, a painting. And uh, then I think the one that really resonated with me though was um, an applique class, a textile class, because I had, um, I had a lot of fabric that I brought because I do work in, in West Africa and Senegal. And so every time I go, I bring back, you know, like boats of fabric one day to sew, you know, I can, I can sew too, <laughs> Sinatra. I just haven't had time to do hardly any of it, but I say, okay, now, but I'm, I want to do this applique thing. And so I uh, got in touch with another artist that I knew that was a friend of mine in a different organization. And, um, she does various mediums. And I took this applique uh, course with her and actually did a piece uh, that I called the jazz singer, a la Sarah Vaughn, which is one of my favorite jazz singers. And so I did that piece. I had my little inspirational piece and then I did my other piece. And the course, the course was that in Atlanta at the Fulton County Arts, um, Ar Arts Commission or the, the Arts, um, but the arts organization in, in Atlanta. And, um, and so they actually had exhibits and she could submit, there were several art classes. So she could submit, um, I think she submitted maybe four or six of her students. And I was one that was submitted and actually one that was chosen to be exhibited. And that was my first time having <laughs> my, my, maybe the second or third piece on exhibit at the Fulton County Arts Council. And I was just so excited. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that came out of me and, and it really was good because it gave me a time that I could just get away totally from my academic thinking and go to my visual art thinking, which is you know, new for me. And I, um, I mean, it was just time because I would look forward to I'd take those classes twice a week in between the classes I was teaching. So I would just look forward to that moment when I could do my little art class. And it was just, you know, she would, you know, talk to us about the history, about the fabric. And so she's, she would give us lectures and then we have, you know, she would work with, she's working on a piece where all of us was working on a piece. And it was a small class. I think it was about maybe 10 of us, eight, uh, maybe eight of us, but um, it was really uh, an exciting time for me because uh, that part of me was coming out that, that normally come out and that, <laughs> And, uh, and to have it exhibited was, was really nice. But um, so that, that really was a positive, very positive um, um, spot in the, in the pandemic journey for me. And then I felt refreshed and then I can go back, you know, and work on my things for my class, work on my research. And, you know, so, was, you know, having these various parts of you come out in, in the right time at the right moment was, was really uh, healing. Because I'm still, as I'm doing all of this, uh, I was also mourning, grieving the passing of both of my parents who passed in 2019. And uh, I had my mother's life celebration in December. And then I had to go right back to work in January. So I was dealing with all this. As a matter of fact, I was actually on virtual classes doing remote uh, before the pandemic, because I told my chair, I could not, I, you know, I just didn't want to go back out and to, to face my students, I, you know, in, in teaching. I mean, I, because before I could mourn one parent who my father passed in May, then my mother passed at the end of November. And so before I, you know, that morning had you know, had dealt with one, then the other one passed. So then I had both on, and then I had, I was a caregiver for two years of two parents. So I had all of that going on and then trying to get, you know, navigate through the pandemic and then dealing with the morning side and trying to do these new, this sort of new class. 
and uh, then trying to take some time for myself and to figure out. So I was kind of reimagining my life really because it had never been of course without my parents. And so I was, um, I guess was trying to figure out, okay, there, these are the two people that had unconditional love for me and that I had unconditional love for them. Both of them gone almost at the same time. So how is my life? You know, how do I reimagine my life? And so that's what I was also dealing with while, um, you know, navigating the pandemic. So I had issues, some health issues myself because of the stress of working, you know, being a caregiver for two years. And then both of your people that you're caring for passed within six months of each other. So I was um, also navigating that while at the same time trying to work with my students and be the best that I could be for them. But, and I told my chair, I couldn't do it. I said, I don't know how, you know, I, so I was planning on taking the FMLA leave again. And he said, what if I just let you go online? Um, and so he made it possible because we nobody was online in January when classes started. So he made it possible for me to go online uh, because, you know, you know, we didn't want to really cancel the classes. And and I just didn't, you know, because, you know, when you when you still morning, you might just you know, something triggers you and you just start crying all of a sudden. I didn't want to just, you know, cry in front of my class and, you know, on the board and trying to do something and something hits me. And I, I wasn't ready to face the public again. I wasn't ready to face my students again. And so he went along with it. He said, okay, well, we're going to, you, you know, we're going to set you up where you can go online. So I had never taught a fully online class before. So that was another thing I had to deal with in teaching online you know, before everybody else went online. I had never done an on online class. So, but anyway, I made it happen. And, um, um, and, and, and I, so I went online in January when we first started classes. But the other thing I was taking uh, therapy, physical therapy, because I had issues, you know, health issues, basically with my back and shoulders and things like that. So I'd go out at 7 a.m. in the morning, I'd take my physical therapy. And if I was going to a grocery store or whatever, I'd come right back home. But even like going to physical therapy was, you know, I enjoyed doing it because I was getting out, <laughs> even though it was going to physical therapy. But I, you know, my physical therapist and I became really close because we were the only ones there except the receptionist. So we were working, you know, working it out physically as I was working other things out mentally and, uh, and spiritually. So um, <clears throat> the next thing is that, that me time. And part of that me time was <laughs> my physical therapist and working with my physical therapist, because we were talking to each other. Her husband was a, uh, you know, a professor too. And, um, and so, you know, we, she knew a lot of the issues that I was dealing with at school. And so, uh, so it was just nice. My physical therapist was almost like my <laughs> mental therapist too. So uh, it worked out. And so we talked a lot to each other. So that really happened well, but I, I took more time. Uh, it's my third area is my me time. I said, and it's for my health, spirituality, restoration, and also to honor others. Um, because during this time, as you know, as as uh, we all know that a lot of people uh, passed, uh, COVID are, are the reasons, and some of my good friends uh, passed uh, in New Orleans. And, you know, I couldn't celebrate them the way we would normally celebrate somebody that's uh, very prominent in the community. And uh, we would celebrate him and knew we would have celebrated him with a second line parade. And so we couldn't do that. And so for me to just, to be able to do something to honor him, I wrote a tribute and just send it out to his family and a lot of people that I knew who also knew him, some of my mutual friends. And so I wrote a tribute to him and the family really thanked me because, you know, it was, it was very difficult because we could not celebrate his life the way we would have normally done in, um, in New Orleans. And then of course I had some other friends that I wrote tributes for, and then I had family members that passed um, that um, I helped with obituaries and, you know, of course, didn't attend the funeral. Most of them didn't even have funerals, but just a family viewing 
period. And that was it. So I, you know, so I had to find out how I could honor others, even though, you know, through their passing and, you know, with their families. And um, the other thing is I had a couple that I worked with that was 92 years old. They were friends of my parents. And so I would go out and just, check, I would check on them, call them and, you know, bring them a meal every now and then they had, you know, the council on aging, but it was good to just see a friendly face that they knew. And they called me their other daughter, their, their, their daughter, one daughter was living in another state. And so she couldn't really come and visit them. So I would just drop in every now and then maybe a couple of times a month uh, to just, you know, be with them for a little while. And so it, it just because I just felt the need to, um, you know, to do something for other people that, you know, that I cared about and that were and some that I didn't know, didn't even know that I had that I did things for. But it's just that you have, you know, so you're trying to keep your life as balanced as possible. And you do these things outside of the pandemic. So you try to keep going the little things that you can control and do during the pandemic. Um, and, you know, and then still trying to get through passing, I mean, getting through mourning, because, you know, that was a really tough time for me. But I found out that, you know, I grew within that time because, you know, I was reading things about death and about mourning and things like that. And, you know, it turns out that I could share it with other people that were, you know, going through some of the same things. So, you know, it, you just never know what you can get through until you have no other choice. And some of those things just, um, you know, just happened. And, but I think I came out okay. I mean, I came out of it on, uh, I know we're not totally out yet, but um, I came out um, as chair of the department, you might say on my academic side, um, that I had, I was elected by the um, professors and I was um, then appointed by the dean and turned out that I was the first woman and African-American or person of color period to chair that department in the 93 years that it existed. So I landed on my feet and, um, you know, and I think all for the better. I grew, you know, I think I became wiser <laughs> in some issues. And uh, so it, it, I can't say it was all bad. I, 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 I grew a lot and, um, you know, in some ways that um, I probably wouldn't have if it hadn't been for the pandemic. And I'll just stop at that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. And now we will have Mikhail's summary. Okay. Mm -hmm. Soutenu Dr. Jackson et Dr. Jackson parlait de différence dans la couleur-là avec pas dans la couleur-là. Et les dit comme ça, ça qui était important pour lui pendant l'époque ça, c'était balancer travail lui, ça veut dire travail l'école avec la vie personnelle lui. Il dit après ça pour travailler, il était besoin connait qui gens pour qu'embé intérêt élève yo parce que il a enseigné en ligne avec il te suivi un séminaire qui aide à mettre plus accès à technologie en dans classe li a. Côté il te mélangé technologie avec réalité a. Et il utilise technologie côté les vio partager travail yo fait, ça veut dire yo fait vidéo, yo fait de voix et puis te submit li dans yon sur un format en ligne côté toute l'autre et les vio gain accès avec li. Et puis, li mandé pour yon mette mais à la patte. Mais à la patte, ça veut dire que pour yon engage yon le travail à faire en dehors de classe là. Ça veut dire tout travail yon pas fait en ligne seulement. Um, li dit que pendant l'époque COVID là, ça a été un difficile pour lui parce que ou connaît moun yon pas de cas de dehors, yon pas de mettre mais à la patte le travail là. C'est ça que fait et si ex si, qui c'était un format en ligne qui permet élève yo partager de voix c'est ça qui fait si si a été vraiment aidé li en pile pendant la première classe li yo. après ça li parlait de et, deuxièmement li parlait de intérêt artistique li li dit comme ça que li prend classe petit et classe petit te permet li détacher avec la vie académique li et pendant la première classe petit ça yo li um, petit yo te arrivé présenté dans une exhibition après ça, il dit que c'est un couturier tout. Donc, ce n'est pas seulement Dr. Sinatra. Um, il parlait de l'obarrage qui est un petit personnel pour lui. Il dit que pendant COVID, là, il perdit des parents. Qui donc, il était obligé de réimaginer la ville dans le COVID sans parents. C'est ça qui fait qu'il commençait 
C'est ça qui fait pour lui-même, il lui était commencé à enseigner en ligne depuis en janvier, en fait, avant de gagner 46 ans. Donc, il était gagné une période d'ajustement avant tout le monde de commencer à enseigner en ligne. Il était qu'on a une physique, dit que ça tout pendant COVID, la physical physique thérapie. Physical thérapie, c'est exercice physique pour aider avec mobilité, au côté où on un docteur. Et puis, il dit comme ça, pendant tant ça, il utilise tant physical thérapie, ça, tant que tant personnel, li, pour lui qu'à rencontrer avec la Après ça, il dit comme ça, l'autre bagaille qui est d'elle, c'est parce qu'elle était mode tête, li, qui j'en, li, qu'à honorer le monde qui a dans tout lui. Qui j'en, li, qu'à aider le monde, parce que dans le moment COVID, là, un peu le monde était seul, il y a des gens qui ont mouru, et il pas même qu'à faire un thème. Donc, il dit, li, qu'à honorer le monde, yo, n'a checké sur yo, et pourtant, li, présent pour yo, li, aide au lait au besoin, et puis, il dit, lui pensait que lui-même, lui sorti ok, même s'il peut qu'on finisse sorti net dans tout, il peut qu'on finisse sorti net dans ajustement Covid là, mais à cause de travail qu'il a fait, il est ses premières filles, premier monde noir qui se chef département anthropologie côté la travail là. Donc, il dit, pour lui-même, c'est balance avec travail avec la vie personnelle. Merci. Thank you. Okay, so our last presenter is also our moderator, Patricia, Dr. Patricia Moïse. Um, so I'll be introducing Dr. Patricia Moïse is currently the cultural and community-based digital curator and Clear Mellon postdoctoral fellow at Cornell College. All right. Okay, thank you. And let me go ahead and share my screen. So thank you, everyone. Um, so today, my presentation is connecting the dots through creativity. So uh, when COVID came, I wasn't even kind of aware of it coming down the pipeline because at the point that uh, the world was talking about it, I was finalizing my thesis and getting ready to defend my presentation. So. I was the last to present at LSU before the world shut down. And so to be able to hear that, no, to hear the news that you've passed and you are now Dr. Moise, but then to turn around and find out that in the process, because our our our, our doctorate was Dr. Doctoral was in two parts, I still had, after my defense, still had to do an exhibition. So it was really like daunting to say, okay, well, what do we do and how do we do it? And so it was definitely detoured, but not deterred. So kind of going in and because of my background and career in disaster recovery, and I just treated COVID like as if it was Hurricane Katrina, like with living in Louisiana, you kind of get used to like, okay, we're going to hunker down and we're just going to get through this. And we got the boudin, we got the beer, and we're going to keep it moving. So I really saw like life was changing. And so there were things that I just said, you know what, you got to just kind of make some rules in your head of what you don't want to lose in the process. So I made it very evident to myself, wrote it on uh, posted, wrote it on paper, had these mantras coming back to me that I did not want to lose my joy. I wanted to take my memories with me. I didn't want to compromise my values. I wanted to keep, I wanted to stay in the fight as possible. Um, I wanted to make sure that I don't allow myself to feel insignificant or exercise hope. I think that, um, Having lived in the spaces that I've lived and seen disaster, there were certain things that I knew were the rules of rebuild. And without having an under, full understanding of COVID, that was going to have to be the case for myself as well. The blessing as well as finishing my doctorate is that, uh, like Sinatra, I won the Clear uh, Mellon Fellowship to now relocate to Grinnell. So leaving my home base of 20 years in the middle of COVID to relocate to Grinnell, Iowa, where there was going to be me in a town of 9,000 people. And still in the back of my mind, I still need to do my exhibition. 
so that I could finish everything off with the hopes that an LSU was trying to promise us that we would still walk because I was the first graduate for the state of Louisiana. And I thought definitely, I definitely having spent a thousand dollars on a cap and gown that I can't get refunded, I gotta make sure that I walk. <laughs> so I had to figure out how to be the best of both worlds. Relocating to Iowa at the same time, leaving my exhibition behind. And so, you know what, I just decided, you know what, I I'm going to make it happen. So before I actually got on the road to hit to Iowa, I went to the gallery, I dropped off all of my artwork. And they said, you know, whenever we're going to be possible, we'll put it up. And so they did. How many people came to see, I have no idea. But thank you to my son. He went in to the gallery during COVID when everything was locked down and he took pictures of my work up on the walls. So I felt validated in that capacity. But what I also did very quickly, because as Sinatra had emphasized, you gotta make yourself known. And if our platforms is digital, then you gotta make yourself found. So while I was now in my orientation, in my training, I was hurrying up and taking all of the works that was on the walls and digitizing them and making a virtual gallery so that I could share with everyone the work that I had been doing for my doctoral and myself as an artist. So the catch of it all was during that time when we were, I was preparing to do this online presentation, um, what I would have done uh, physically, if I was still in Louisiana, we got hit with a derecho. So, so I packed up all my stuff in the storm and everything like that, uh, was living and hopping from hotel to hotel in Des Moines. And from a hotel room, did my artist walk because the show could not stop now. So I knew I had to be the best of both worlds. I had to make sure that I was presentable in Louisiana and presentable online. Another thing that I did was I chronicled my entire journey leaving Louisiana. And I saw this as an opportunity, like I said, not to lose my joy, not to lose my hope and not to lose my memories, is I created a platform called IG and I and Instagram called IET underscore discovered. Because I have always lived within Haitian communities in New York and Miami and in Louisiana. And this was the first time that I was going to a place in a space that had very few people of color and let alone a state that had no Haitians to my knowledge. So therefore I needed to see what made me Haitian. How Haitian am I? So I just started recording myself, driving myself to uh, Iowa. What was I engaging? What was I looking for? What were the markers that would bring me comfort? And I started to chronicle for my audience and build an audience of where I tried to stay true to my narrative. So I started, I started calling, calling my episodes up. Poochie in the Prairie or the Me to She Journey or Color Girl Chronicles, where I would give people the experience of not feeling alone because I didn't want to feel alone. And so I started to build a base of saying, you know what, Patricia, you have the opportunity to really bring people who did not know about the Haitian culture or, or know about the diaspora living the Haitian culture. Um, so this is kind of like a, a way of engaging and staying connected and building to the work that you're going to be doing because one of my responsibilities is to create the digital catalog for the largest collection of Haitian art in the world at the Waterloo Center of the Arts. So I figured that if I could build an audience, then I could start to introduce to them the work that I did. So I took a soft and, and, and comical approach at first to my work. And of course, the encouragement and the messaging of what I would want somebody to tell me. So in COVID, of course, the mental health, it was very important. So I had to understand that self-care was not selfish that I needed to take uh, take care of myself, which is kind of like, it was, it was a complete 180 for me because I had always had a life of where I took care of everyone else. So now I was going to be by myself in an apartment, in a place that I've never been before, um, having to build and I'd had to take care of myself. And if any of you guys have ever followed me, you know that I sprain anything in the course of every week. <laughs> I've got something new sprained. So I've had the crutch life 
Um, and so I have all medical contraptions in this apartment now. I am well prepared now going into year two. But I wanted to make sure that other people's fixations, because we were going to be watching a lot of people communicate a lot of the things that they weren't going to be able to handle or, or not be able to handle or handle well. But I knew that, that I had to safeguard my own endurance. And in doing so, in finding the connections within and without, I developed some skills. I learned how to become an archivist, a community builder, a restorative healer, and a strategist because I brought with me pictures of family because I didn't have family with me. I brought pic generational pictures of my family. Um, we are a community, a very small community of Black scholars in Grinnell and a staff of, uh, I think that there's close to 200 um, 200 professors on campus and 46 are BIPOC and of the 46, 13 are uh, black women. And so we were able to make that as a community for ourselves. And it was, it was daunting because, you know, it was always black sightings. And we made sure that we traveled together. We made sure that each one of us knew where the other one was because there were certain racial issues that was popping up around town. And so that also played into my ability to feel safe in the work that I had to do ahead of me. And I also had the community of Black scholars from Haitian Studies Association and women Black scholars that we, you know, we reinforced each other, we encouraged each other. And so I very much appreciated that effort of making those connections um, around me as well as digitally. So in doing so, I realized that there was a lot of talent that I had that I was bringing to the table. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't mute myself because I was uncomfortable, because I wasn't sure of how people would receive me. So I made sure that I, you know, my, my superpowers were always, was always present. Um, but I stayed being the artist. I, I stayed being creative. I, I made an effort to think of things differently, um, even sometimes when I didn't want to. But I was like, we have to think of things a different way because right now the playbook is not the same. So like what I did for myself was learning through trial and error. I was like, you know what? Nothing works without a recipe. And once we've done things and we've learned it, then we could go out and teach it. So I tried many things. One was ceramics. I tried pottery because I live right next door in the alley to the art council and they have a ceramics. Um, a pottery a class, and I realized that it is an ego buster for me. It is not something that I do well because I don't want to give up my nails. So if for anybody who wants to think about taking on pottery, you cannot have nails. But um, And I did the mistake of buying 25 pounds of porcelain instead of stoneware, so everything was fragile and frail. But I was thinking of my grandmother and her china, and I thought I could do the same. Um, but instead, I taught myself to cook, um, found this wonderful cookbook, and I said, you know what, if I'm going to discover how Haitian I am, I am going to go ahead and try every single recipe. So, of course, when you have an air fryer, you do try to convert all the recipes, and so that was my banan bukane in an air fryer, and this was my way of doing it piece, because if you come from a Haitian family, you do not know how to cook for one. So the challenge was now how to cook <laughs> in, the in the context that I knew, but then how to preserve it because I did not want to waste food. So this was me doing my it piece for the year. And that whole batch actually lasts about a year and a half for me. So I put them in freeze trays and I was putting them in and I was sharing the recipe with everyone. And what I started to learn was the fact of Patricia, you still the consultant. You can still consult people in doing different things, different ways. So when you learn that, then you learn the formulas of success. So I am a, a business consultant, but I started to become a mentee for the students on campus. So for our first year, we were not allowed to have the students on campus. Um, we all worked remotely. And so that relationship that I had to build had to be different because the students did not know me. I didn't have kind of like 
a classroom or an office that people could walk by and who's Dr. Moise and how are we going to get to know her? So I started to work through my colleagues to get to know their students, their classes. I would audit classes where I would get introduced. And then the second year, um, I wanted a student to work in the studio with me. So I looked for a student to mentor. And so I was blessed with um, Paula Persiani, who uh, was a senior who, who just graduated and will be doing her master's at NYU uh, for fine arts. And so I was able to mentor her through her senior exhibition. Um, I was able to take my experience as a first responder to the classroom where I taught my first class because Grinnell allows you to create your own topics um, as a liberal arts college. So I started to talk about the narrative uh, that art plays in disaster recovery because I knew that the students had their own experiences coming from their own communities of how they were going to process COVID. And when the class started, we started to have the situation with Russia. So those kind of elements of watching different communities be affected maybe by man-made or natural disasters, we, we gave the space for them to discuss that. So being able to look at, look at COVID and for the students to be able to bring their experiences to the classroom was very creative. And then like Sinatra, I like to celebrate um, black owned businesses, especially women black owned businesses. So as I started to discover black owned businesses, I would lend my experience as a business coach. And so this is, um, I forgot the name of the, the shop in North Carolina um, where I went and I met this lady who had just opened up her shop. She is the only black owned female cigar shop in the state. And so I was celebrating her and her efforts and sharing at gratis uh, for free, um, some kind of business tips that she could to level and how to utilize the internet to market her business, different events that she could throw that would be COVID safe and that would still help promote her business. So definitely when you know the recipe, you share. So I had to go out, I had to go find my tribe and it all starts with that first step. So utilizing my platform of IET underscore discovered, um, I started to try to find artists in the community, Haitian artists, uh, cause I'm four hours away from Chicago, um, Milwaukee. So I started to go all around looking for artists and venues to celebrate Haitian art. Because one of the things that happened during COVID is we couldn't travel, so I couldn't get to Haiti. Um, so it took me two years to finally get to Haiti and to get to Jacques Mel and Port-au-Prince uh, to see the artists there. But I said, you know what, let's not let this stop me. This is an opportunity and this is a platform to keep the conversation going. So it helped me to build my network and to find my tribe. Next was definitely forging the future that I wanted to see. So one of the things that was very important in the work that I do here and also in the discovery of myself was to make sure that I was able to communicate those things to all platforms. And I started to understand the importance of language, of the Creole language, the French language and the Spanish language and the English language in the Haitian landscape. And I wanted to be able to sure, be sure that I was able to be effective in all of that and create spaces where all of that can happen. So I, my uh, participation with HSA, I was, have been on previous other panels. Um, I, we've been able to bring the talent and the, the special, I wanna say the talent, but also a subject expert to Grinnell and to surrounding museums in the area uh, to talk about different aspects of Haitian art. Um, I've gone to uh, Art Basel and translated for the Miami Basel and translated for different um, panels there. Uh, just recently with Sinatra, I went to the AAAM and started to kind of talk about where is the Haitian 
signature in the African American Museum and where are we in the landscape. Um, so definitely I felt that for me, I definitely stepped up my game in becoming a translator in a culture baron as a spokesperson. So definitely said that in this time, by the time COVID is over, I would like my future to be a lot better than, <laughs> than my past. So what COVID has definitely done is hone in my, my, my view of being Haitian, but also to leverage that into different projects that I could move forward on. So WAPCON art is me taking, my, uh, me taking those experiences of traveling around the diaspora. And if I could be the Johnny Appleseed of Haitian art, I would love to be where we're able to showcase all of the museums and the galleries in the global North and South and bringing awareness to artists and shaping that narrative and um, bringing more people to the opportunity that when COVID is truly over and the world opens up again, that they now have new places and new sites to travel to. Um, also, the Lakai project for me is very important because it shows how my uh, first love is connected to my second love. My first love is Haiti and my second love is Louisiana. So I feel that it's important for us to be able to show how we have maintained that bridge, preserved the culture, and how can we digitize moving forward? Because through the two experiences of Hurricane Katrina and the earthquake, I understand how important memory is and how our material culture plays so much in our sense of identity. And the last is the Voodoo Reboot, in which I am looking to work with um, Haitian artists and Haitian American artists in the diaspora uh, to see how we can bridge the connectivity back to Haiti and looking at our contemporary works and how do they fit in sacred spaces. So what I feel that COVID has done is, is incubated me into coming up with different projects that I would like to spearhead in the future. But in that process, um, it took a lot to hold up this backbone, um, a lot of mantras, a lot of encouragement, a lot of words from the, the people around me and the digital world that I stayed connected to. So my lessons learned here are the fact that health is part of the whole. It's not just a piece of it, but it is part of the whole. But sometimes we have to take things in segments. So doing things in segments is still remembering that you are part of the big picture and you are the big picture. Um, definitely doing things that make your ripple count, focusing on goals that have residuals that you can see and speak of. Um, and that time matters when you do what matters. If things matter to you, then sometimes I know that there were periods of time where we felt things took so long. And then there are other times where we felt like we that time was fleeting. So I, I encourage people to strive for the quality of the moment and not the quantity of moments. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Now um, we have Diane. Okay, so nous s'attendait à um, Dr. Petrushka qui parlait de COVID et puis il dit que COVID prend une mi-temps défense doctorale. Et pendant l'époque COVID, là, tout, c'est là qu'il a gagné une exhibition, mais il n'y a pas même qu'à une exhibition parce que il y a besoin de changer, il y a besoin de déménager, qui était côté le TEA pour aller de l'autre côté parce qu'il était venu en boussière melon. Um, après ça, il dit que ça que um, c'est ça qui fait les créer un espace digital en ligne côté les publier petits lieux pour le cas pour le cas connecté avec et petits lieux et pour le monde cas accéder petit salut tout. Les créer tout un compte Instagram côté les à apprendre connait ça qui fait les c'est haïtien pour qui ça les haïtien et puis pour les aider le monde pas sentir pour compte les parce que dans zone côté la vie là pas vraiment gagné un pile ici. Donc, il peut pas rencontrer aucun ici dans ce genre ça. Il dit que ça, tout ça qui est vraiment important, c'est que il prend soin de tête. Prend soin de tête, tout c'est pas égoïste. Deuxième point, il parlait à c'est que l'air ou c'est pour prendre soin de tête tout parce que ça veut dire si on prend temps pour tête tout pour faire ça au ce c'est pas égoïste. Il dit pendant que tu fais ça, il te joue une connexion en dehors 
et en dedans tête li dans sens comme si tout bagaille la fait aider le connecter avec l'autre monde qui dans même domaine avec lui c'est comme ça il apprend un pile bagaille tant que préservation données comme archiviste et puis il rencontre monde fait ça veut dire il fait connexion professionnelle dans le troisième point, il parle qui ça fait pour tête, qui ça fait pour tête pendant la COVID, il apprend pendant la fête et Ça veut dire qu'il apprend par les faire en bagaille, les faire erreur, les faire encore, donc par un commitment de ça la fête. Il apprend à faire manger haïtien parce que ça t'a aidé à découvrir dans quel niveau haïtien il est. Ça veut dire comme si c'était une échelle de 1 à 100. Li apprend fè bagay ki ap edel dekouvri nan ki, nan ki, ki bo li, li e li menm nan echel sa. Um, Apre sa li pale de tout bagay sa yo edel li veye, edel li kreye yon formule de succès E formule de succès sa li aplike li nan relasyon de mentor avec protéger li gen nan l'ekol kote la travay la. Sa vle di deske li gen tan fè tout expérience sa yo, li itilize expérience sa yo pou li ede élèves dans l'école Lio pour les aider à um, faire exhibition et puis aider dans deux mains. Ça veut dire une relation mentor et puis protégé. Après ça, il aide le business mounois parce que ça est important pour lui. Il li bâille un conseil pour grandir le business en ligne. Quatrième point, il parle de l'IA, il dit chercher le monde par Lio pour lui célébrer les artistes haïtiens. Donc, il cherche le monde par Ça veut dire qu'il essaie de faire une connexion, un système de network système de network là pour les collecter avec l'autre haïtien et puis pour les aider à grandir artistes et puis petite petit culture haïtienne. Il parlait aussi de créer des mes livres de Il dit pendant la COVID, ça qui est important, là où on a une situation, vous pensez avec ça, vous voulez ouais des mes. Et à travers, et non, non, il dit ça, il était travail de translation créole, français avec anglais. Après ça, pour finir, il parlait de qui ça COVID fait pour lui. Il dit que COVID est de lui reconnecter art haïtien parce que lui pas clairé les miens sous artiste noyau. Ça veut dire mettre un mettre artiste noyau plus devant scène pour mon kawai ou pour mon kakone qui ça y a fait. Il aussi parlait de reconnexion avec Vodou, avec lui parlait de qui j'en santé, c'est une pièce importante de travail la paix. Ça veut dire que faut prendre soin de tout. Dernièrement, il parlait de diaspora et qui j'en diaspora yo fait partie de la communauté a, et qui j'en diaspora yo tout qui participe participé la culture noire là avec la artistrie haïtienne. Merci. Merci, Michael. So now we are going to open up our questions with our panelists. So at this point in time, we invite everyone to uh, if Irene could, uh, yes, thank you very much. We post the, uh, the Google Doc. If you have a question for us in general or for the panelists specifically, we ask that you put your questions on the Google Doc so that we can keep everything in order. And uh, Irene will um, manage the Q&A um, after. So now I would like to, um, open up the floor to Dr. Sinatra Smith, who will lead us in the questions uh, for Dr. Jackson and myself. Thank you. Uh, fantastic presentations. I really learned a lot about both of you. It was great to hear what you all have been doing since the pandemic started and even a little bit before. Um, my first question is related to the fact that um, self-care, but especially in artistic practice, was a common thread throughout all of our experiences. So. My question is, as we continue to transition into a sort of post-pandemic normal, and when I say post, I mean, you know, it may not really be after, but just like an Anno Domini situation in the year of our Lord, right? <laughs> um, where, uh, where we can get back to our routines of overextending and increased social, socializing, as well as reaping the fruits of all of the seeds that we sowed throughout the pandemic. Have either of you thought about how you plan to bring that work-life work balance with you into your next phase? Uh, 
I, I need you to kind of ask that question because that was like, I was still wrapping myself on that intro. I was like, I was popping collars and feeling good. So could you, <laughs> could you truncate that <laughs> a little bit? Like, yes. Yeah. So my question is basically now that we're kind of transitioning into a alleged post pandemic world, how do you plan to bring your work life balance um uh, practice, especially the art, into the future so that you're not continuing the trend of the overextending and, you know, losing all of that work that we've been able to do within the past two years on ourselves to make sure that we're all right. Okay, I'll go first. Um, I think for me is like making that dedicated time. Um, like I, I was, I was saying to someone, I do not regret the giving that I've given. I just wish that I included myself in the giving. And so one of the things that I've done is made the art council, which is right next door with the gal with the, the pottery class, which has other classes. So I'm gonna skip the pottery class, <laughs> donate the donate my porcelain to somebody else and move on to maybe learning something else. Cause I think it's very important. I, I really do enjoy learning. Uh, I'm a lifelong learner. I do so too, but I stay in the parameter of a square ladies. Uh, so anything that's a square, I can sew, <laughs> but I do want to learn new skills. And I, and I do think that it's important because what happens is it helps me to understand when my students are in the classroom and they're learning me and they're learning the subject matter and they're having a hard time with it. And I can relate to them and say, and I could be completely transparent without giving my personal information and say, look, this is what happened to me. And this is when I had to breathe and walk away and honor that. Um, I think that there's a lot of things that are no longer traditional for us processing that mental health um, that we used to exercise in the classroom before, right? So I don't get offended if a kid has to get up and walk away. And, and capture, the, capture the breath and come back in, or they're lagging, just understand that they have to be responsible of the information a bit. And sometimes some of the subject matters that I had brought across in the classroom, I've had to excuse myself from the class and say, you know what, it's a, it's a tear shedding moment. Dr. Moyes is gonna be in the, in the hallway for five minutes talking among yourselves. You know, just because we have to build that level of respect as we start to learn where that mental health is, so. That's mine. Dr. Jackson, you're muted. Okay, sorry. Uh, well, I'll uh, look at um, sort of uh, the academic side too right now and then talk a little bit about the other side. But uh, in going into, like I said, at the end of the first two years of the pandemic, that's when I became chair of the department. So that's certainly um, changed my schedule a lot. Instead of you know teaching two days a week, uh, two classes, all of a sudden now I'm, I'm having to be there five days a week and teaching one class. So uh, it's a very different arrangement than what I had been uh, you know adjust, uh, um, accustomed to. And so I must say that I overdid <laughs> some of the work uh, in the times that I worked, because as a new chair, um, you know, there were some things, some extra things that I had to do. And it's a learning curve with a lot because I had never been in that type of administrative situation before. I directed a program, the African African-American Studies program, but not an entire chair. Well, I had to supervise over 40 some people. So I went from the uh, African-American studies program had four professors and then the rest of them were affiliates. So I mainly was, you know, fully supervising four professors. Then I went from that one to supervising 22 professors and then associates, research associates, instructors, and staff members. So that was, you know, to 40 some people. Um, and I felt that I needed to, but in time, being there at the six and seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night, 
Uh, but I promised myself, if I've been through that a year now, I promised myself that I was <laughs> going to take better care of myself and, um, and not stay there um, those extra hours. Because uh, normally the offices shut down at 4.30. <clears throat> well, I'm there, you know, several hours after that. And not every day, but three, four days out of the week, I was doing that. So I said, no, Joyce, <laughs> you're going to have to do better. So I promised myself uh, and my creator that I wouldn't do that this year. And so I've started off pretty good. We don't start classes until tomorrow, but um, I already have my morning, my schedule that I intend to stick by because, you know, I have to keep, like say, we have to look at health first because if we don't have our health, we can't do everything else that we envision to do. So that's one of the things that I really have to keep strict um, account of, uh, my time, time management, and uh, because it can be sucked up with emails during the course of a day. And, uh, and with me time, uh, and I didn't mention it before, but I, I was able to get into doing much more of the, the things that I would normally do, like yoga and walking, but I did it really on a regular basis during the pandemic. And I got off during this past year to a certain extent, but I did go to do workouts in the afternoons after, um, after, after classes or if I could leave work in time enough to, to get to the Women's Wellness Center. But uh, I have to really be cognizant that forget about self and you're doing everything for everyone else. So I really try I'm trying to keep my yoga on a regular, um, uh, at a regular time as well as my um, meditation prayer time and, and walking or whatever other exercise I'm doing, because I don't, I don't walk all the time. Sometimes I dance and do Zumba and things like that. So um, I have to just really um, check myself periodically and make sure that I'm, I'm staying on a health regimen as well as you know all the other stuff that I do. And one of the other things that came out of it was, because I also have a nonprofit organization and um, I was able to put more time into that and setting up things and doing websites uh, for that. And so it's, I have to carve that in. So now it's, it's basically carving in the things that I learned to um, navigate more in a better way over the pandemic to keep those things going. And so that's what I'm really um, trying to do. But again, I have to write everything down in my journal, on my calendar, and to keep reminding myself every day that this is what I need to do. Um, thank you. That's it. Mm -hmm. So now, Dr. Jackson, you have questions for us? Yeah, I, I, uh, I, we're all doing a lot of things. <laughs> and to think about the pandemic, I, I really want to know, um, like, what was most impactful throughout all the things you did during the pandemic? I mean, we did academic stuff, we did, you know, um, exhibits, you, you all areas and doing diff different types of training, formal and informal for you, whether it was in academics or, you know, on your creative side or your me time, what was most impactful for your life during that time? Sinatra, you go first. So... The, the thing that's screaming in my head, and I was, I was, I learned recently, go with your first mind, is networking. This whole fellowship has been about networking. All of the work that I've done with my professional association has been networking. Um, putting out the, the projects online was really because I was doing all this networking and folks are like Googling me and inviting me to things. And I was like, let me make sure the stuff that they're seeing about me is accurate because they're, I've noticed they're seeing a lot of stuff that I said back in August of 2020, when I didn't know what I was doing in this fellowship that I had just started and was making stuff up and just kind of flying by the seat of my pants. And I'm like, mm, so I'm not doing any of that. Um, none of that was accurate. That was just me pretending that I knew what I was talking about. These are the things I'm actually doing, but I, I, it's all because of the networking. Other people have been sharing um, my work and it's finally gotten to the point where someone has reached out to me to participate in something and, that I did not know already. Or that person, I, I assume based on the email account that they reached out to, which was not my email account at all. It was like the general library account at my, um, my job. 
I assume that they don't know me and they don't know a person who knows me. So I feel like the networking has officially truly and totally paid off and being nominated for that award is really a testament to the networking, right? Like someone had to know who I was and what I was working on in order to nominate. I really wanna know who that person is in order to nominate me for that award. So I think that will be, and then through the networking, through all of these, like our summer seminar where Patricia and I met when we started the first, um, this, the fellowship, that's how I was able to kind of build this network of colleagues that was within our fellowship. There's other like mentoring opportunities they've created for us with different folks, but I've learned a lot from my peers. I think I've probably learned more from my peers, from the folks who are currently in the fellowship or recently did it about what we're doing individually um, in terms of like which skills we're learning, but also how we're applying this work outside of our spaces. So I think, you know, that's probably been the the biggest thing that I've I've benefited from so far. Okay. For myself, I would say definitely consistency, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the networking, and being consistent with following up with the network. Um, Sinatra is not lying. We like we were faking it <laughs> as soon as we got in. We the cameras was in our face and people wanted to know that, you know, because we we're supposed to be these experts and we're all going through imposter syndrome. And um, but I think for me, it definitely was like when I started to take the road trip and see what the world was outside of my college campus. And I just was like, OK, Facebook family, Instagram family, I'm jumping on the road. You know who I am. I don't have a sense of direction, please. You know, like I took them through every storm, through every hotel. I raided every mute restaurant but then i started to meet people at at point b and point c and point d and then when i started to know a little bit of something and i started to build workshops so this summer um we were bring, able to bring jean daniel lafontaine who is a historian and a curator and we were able to look at the voodoo pantheon and its impact on the arts but i didn't just keep it to grinnell I, I brought him to the Figgy. I brought him to all these places. Wherever I went before, I was like, now I'm bringing the talent with me so I could, we could build on this relationship. So I do appreciate that they opened arms to me when they didn't even know who I was. But now I'm wanting to them to know that, you know, I want to keep continuing this relationship. I want to forge this. I want to build this, this kind of pipeline of information. So it's definitely being consistent. I think that for me, in my networking is just to make sure that I follow up and that, um, that I'm letting people know what it is that I'm doing and what I'm working on. And like Sinatra said, it's our peers, you know, celebrating when they're doing something, being available, connecting resources. Um, you know, I, I send things back to Dr. Dr. Jackson and be like, hey, I know you into this. And then she sends me things back. So I think definitely keeping up with the sharing is, was very important in my lesson. Um, my question before we turn it over to the room, um, and it's a real quick question, which is that both you ladies, uh, Dr. Jackson has had years of hiring, and now that she's the chair, uh, congratulations, of the department, and uh, Sinatra is, Sinatra acts like she does, she's not the boss, but she really is the boss, um, but in the hiring process, as we start to look forward into how the COVID has changed the dynamics. How has that changed the dynamics of hiring for you or what you look now in working with teams and working with people? What are some of the talents that you feel are now, weren't valued before COVID, but now you see them as assets to uh, workforce development? Well, I'll go first. Um... And I have to look at it from both ways, from my, my faculty, as well as some of the people that we have tried to hire over the years. Uh, well, well, my one year as chair, but in, you know, as being a professor too, just to see some of the things that have changed. Um, and uh, of course, we all know that DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, uh, world is here, although it has been there, but people are more focused on that now. And, and uh, so I had to do that and had to make some requirements for my faculty. I mean, before I came in, I saw we tried to do a quote unquote diversity hire. And um, there was some reluctancy with, with some of the faculty members. 
And, uh, I, and, and so I, when I look at diversity, I go, I mean, I, I'm looking at it in the broader sense. And um, there was some really uh, kickback in, in some folks in my department. And so when I became chair, I made it mandatory that all people who, particularly those that are going to serve on, um, on search committees have the diversity training. Uh, the DEI training. And, um, and, and the other thing I did was to put an DEI advocate on the search committee. I mean, we have the, you know, we, you have this, look at my department, it's a joint department of geography and anthropology. And so on my search committees, even if we are trying to hire geography, we also put anthropologists on the search committee. If I'm hiring an anthropologist, I also put geographers on the search committee. But I also have to have one person that is an advocate on the search committee that has been through the training and much more. And they know the, the things to look for. They know the, they know the triggers and all of that. It's very important these days with the hires that the hires that we do has well, been important. But now, of course, now we can focus on have these things in place. We you can actually get the training. You can't say I didn't know. You can't say that anymore. Because um, not only do I require my uh, faculty to have the training, but I mean, I bring the training into them. We just had a one day retreat yesterday for all my faculty members. I brought in a Title IX person to speak to them and give them a workshop. So they cannot say, well, you know, I haven't had that yet. I didn't know this. I didn't know I was supposed to be a reporter. But I, no, I'm bringing them to you. You're here. I want to make sure that you have this training. I, and so you don't just leave it at you know, because you leave it to them, some of them won't do it. Um, they don't believe it's, you know, not saying that they don't believe it, that, that it is important, but they focus on their research, they focus on their whatever, and they just won't take the time to do it sometimes. So that is one thing that I've had to put in place as far as, you know, hiring, the hiring situation and looking at different candidates. And, uh, and, and frankly, you know, my, my department is one that really needs to, to um, you might say, to uh, come to another level on that because over the years, and like I said, it's 93 years old, they never even had a woman chair. So what do you think that, what, what does all that mean? You know, so I had to come in putting things in place, you know, and because dealing with diversity has in various ways, you know, people of color, women, handicap, you know, the whole bit, you know, the broadest, um, definition of diversity. And so that's what I had to come. That was my first, like, in my first step, you might say, in coming into the department, I let them know this is what's going to happen. And um, so that's where I had to deal with it from the beginning, you know, and they will have some more. I mean, we did uh, Title IX yesterday. And uh, for the first faculty meeting, I'll have a person coming in from the DEI office to do that. Members can say that they did not have training. Okay, so that's just one thing. Um, okay, and then we have that. Sinatra, and then Mikhail has her hand up. So um, I've been on several committees to hire interns and fellows at my institution. Um, and often I feel like the representative of the Negro delegation, and so I behave as such. Um, I'm usually the only Black person on the committee. Um, maybe even sometimes the only BIPOC person. So I'm always looking with that DEI, DEIA lens. Um, and the way that that's kind of manifested is when I'm reading someone's um, cover letter or their essay, if there's one required for the position, I'm looking for them to have a more mission-driven interest in the work rather than just PMA is a huge institution, it's nationally recognized, and so it'd be great to work there. We all know that, that's easy. You don't even need to include that in your essay. Just tell me why you're committed to the particular work that you're interested in doing, um, because there's been a lot of folks who have been given the opportunity to work there, particularly as permanent staff, but even through internships and fellowships that um, I'm not sure if they appreciate the opportunity the way that the rest of us would who have been um, historically excluded from that institution between the work that's on the walls and the folks who are putting that work on the walls. Um, I'm also 
uh, interested in folks who may have limited experience because, you know, as interns and fellows, they might be undergraduate students. They might have a degree or two, but they don't necessarily need experience. I just want them to be hungry for a skill set. And I like to, as a person who they may work with, be flexible in what skill sets they may be able to, to use. So even with the fellowship that um, I'm the primary mentor for at Temple, um, the first year we kind of had a more specific project for them to work on, but the second year we're like, okay, we're gonna build on this, but we wanna know what you're interested in doing. We can introduce you to some of the things that we already know, but if there are specific things that you learned in your training that you did the month before the fellowship, or just things you're interested in general, let us know and we can kind of pivot and move in that direction. Um, I try to be flexible with uh, communication styles. Um, I do not believe in weekly meetings. I think that is too often. <laughs> I don't want to be in a meeting every week and I don't want to have to manage someone who requires a meeting every week. So I'll, I usually stick with a bi-weekly meeting cadence and then introduce them to Slack if they're not already familiar. And then of course, email is an opportunity. And then in order to work with me personally, which isn't always the case, but if they're gonna be working with me, they need to be, they need to understand that what we're working on are projects that are specific to black art history, culture, all of that. I use the FUBU model, forest bias. I'm not interested in things that are about Black folks that were created by someone that's non-Black. I really want Black folks representing ourselves. And I'm working with art for the most part. And so that ends up canceling out a lot of folks who are making work that depicts Blackness. And a lot of my colleagues are sometimes questioning that like, well, why aren't you including this artist? Because that artist is not Black. And so I need my any intern or fellow who works with me to understand that that is how I roll. And if you're not okay with it, then you may not want to work with me. You don't have to be black. You don't have, an, have to have an expertise in black things, but you need to know that this is the work that we're going to do. So <laughs> that's kind of what I'm uh, looking at. I'm not on a, any official hiring committee. So maybe my answer would change a little bit if that were the case, but for interns and fellows, that's kind of where I'm at right now. And she thought she wasn't a boss. Okay. <laughs> so we have one question uh, we can take before we have to end today. Uh, Mikael, you had your hand up. Oh, yes. I was just putting out that we have a question in the chat. Um, we have a question for Dr. Joyce. And then we have one question. Um, one question, I take it apply to everyone. So do you want me to read it for you? Or are you going to, is it fine? Uh, go ahead, read the question for Dr. Joyce. Okay, um, the question to Dr. Joyce said, regarding the ethnographic work that you assigned to your undergraduate student, did your student conduct any interviews via Zoom? Was there anything that your student learned while conducting those interviews? Yes, um, uh, like I said, we had to sort of pivot in how we do field work. And, um, you know, it, that was an experience within itself because, you know, of course, you normally go out and you're face to face with the person and then they had to, you know, do it in, a, in alternative ways. So, yes, they learned, um, well, how to think, think creatively in, in doing the ethnographies. And uh, some of them uh, you had to deal with the technology, too, because, because um, even using... Um, what is it called? Fa not Facebook. Um, what's that you do on your phone? Um, the um, FaceTime. FaceTime. The FaceTime. On the, some of them had never done FaceTime, and so they learned how to do FaceTime and um, other, you know, on the phone and um, you know, interviewing people on the phone, and you know, which is you know, is is, is not the same as in in person. So you have to pick up different cues. We talk about. Uh, the type of questions that you ask and you just don't pick up a you know microphone or whatever and just ask questions but you think about them uh, you give it a lot of thought not only what you're asking but how you're asking the question and so they had to figure out you know where they asked the question this way well they didn't really answer so they had to turn that question around a different way to ask it and then they would get an answer so they had to you know try to figure out what was best for that particular person that they were working with because the the same type of technique doesn't work with one is the, that you, you use with this one doesn't work with the next. So you know it's things like that. They learn uh, quite a bit on how you know 
the best case scenario is face to face as far as I'm concerned, but they learn how to do it in an alternative way and still got good results. So uh, yes, they, it was a good experience for them. Mikael, mm -hmm. we have one last question the, for all of us and then we will wrap up. Uh, yes, um, uh, one second. The question said, how do you do the transition from past COVID and the future as an artist? I think that question is for you, Dr. Petrushka. How do I transition? Um, post -COVID, uh, for post-COVID to future, um, one of the things is really looking at the different ways the, diff the platforms have been utilized, um, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, uh, and not being afraid of them. Uh, I'm not on TikTok yet because I will be addicted in a minute, in a minute. But also uh, as artists, we have, we, we changed the narrative um, where it's not a red rope experience anymore. We bring the person in. So for, for artists, I always say, also say document, and that's the archivist to me, document your process, document your materials, Educate us, educate why you're doing what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, that is one of the things that uh, I think that keeps my audience engaged with me is because I am, I don't mind laughing at myself and I, I, I'm, 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 I'm a comedian of one uh, in the sense of the things that I discover um, about myself and how I bring that to my art. Uh, quick short story. Uh, one of the things that happened is when being here and somebody knocking on your door, like you owe them money. And that's because my doorbell didn't, was stopped ringing and they had to knock on the door. Well, uh, I live on a second floor walk up. So to walk down the stairs, the first thing I grabbed was a machete. So I was like, you know what? This makes me very Haitian right now <laughs> to answer the door with the machete. But I, I looked at that as a way of you know, also looking at metalwork and looking at the arts and thinking about that in my future work. And I was like, this is a great story to talk about how I got to where this piece is going to end up being. And as artists, we know that we don't want to kind of, um, when somebody walks up to the art, we kind of want to know what they thinking, what has evoked of them. But sometimes art appreciato, uh, people who appreciate our art, our people who collect our art also want to hear the backstory of what made us make what we made, you know? So um, I definitely tell people, you, you're your own best narrative. Um, not to say that we don't need the critics and we don't need the historians and we don't need the scholars, but nobody could tell the story better than you can. So look at that as your future. So, um, I'm going to say thank you to everyone who were well, five minutes uh, over time, but I want to thank everybody who was here with us today. Um, I want to thank you, Haitian Studies Association, for hosting this. Um, I thank uh, Irene for challenging me to have this uh, discussion today. Um, I hope that everybody has a blessed day. Uh, and of course, think creatively as we move forward in COVID. <laughs>